All right. <coughs> Monday, um, March 1st, 2021, 6.30 p.m. I'm calling the Board of Select and to order. Um, <coughs> we have a fairly varied uh, agenda tonight. I didn't want to make one opening comment um, <coughs> on agenda items. I saw a note on a, a website <coughs> uh, earlier today. <clears throat> which may not really have been intended to be, you know, a, a comment about um, uh, our meetings, but I thought I would clarify something about it. And it said that um, <clears throat> uh, chairs were free to take agenda items out of order. And that's not actually um, <clears throat> true. So if an agenda item has a time on it, um, uh, I am not free to take that agenda item up before the time that's on the agenda item. So for example, uh, tonight we have um, agenda item number four is annual town meeting date and it's scheduled for 7.30 p.m. If I'd finished up with other business uh, and it wasn't 7.30 yet, I could not take that up until we got to 7.30. I could take agenda items out of order <clears throat> that I do not have times on them. So for example, I could take the consent agenda out of order in order to fill time if I needed to. But uh, I just wanted to make that clear in case people <clears throat> were making the assumption that they had to be here from the beginning of the meeting to see all of the agenda items. It's not actually strictly true. If it has a time on it, it will not ever start before that time by law. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, let's get going. First item on the agenda is uh, outdoor dining discussion. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be uh, that time of year and again in this um, uh, uh, ridiculous cycle that we're in. Um, uh, the governor has um, allowed uh, restaurants to go to full capacity, but they're still required to have seating set uh, six feet apart. Um, and beyond that, uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, residents who are going to have concerns about going into indoor dining. So uh, as it warms up again, we're going to be uh, looking at the possibility of having indoor outdoor dining again for some period of the year. We don't know uh, how that's gonna play out. So anyway, this tonight is an opening discussion about um, <clears throat> uh, what, uh, what level of appetite we have for that and um, uh, what steps we would uh, wanna take as a board before making a de decision uh, on, on outdoor dining. We are not going to be making any decisions about um, whether or not we're committing to outdoor dining, and that will come at a, a later meeting, but we will be um, uh, considering it fairly soon because it's going to warm up fairly soon. We hope, everybody hopes, right? All right, so um, Greg, do you have any other uh, comments that you'd wanna make? And then I'm gonna go around the board uh, asking for opinions on uh, how we might wanna go. No, just that uh, we've had a couple of inquiries from some of the restaurants as to what our thoughts are on allowing outdoor dining again. As you mentioned, um, the governor has uh, loosened up the restrictions so restaurants can um, have 100% uh, occupancy if, and it's a big if, if they can keep their uh, tables six feet apart. So obviously many places cannot. So that in a sense is a de facto restriction still. Um, and how things change over the next, you know, over the next month and a half is is hard to predict. Um, but um, nonetheless, I, I would expect there be a fair high, a fair amount of high interest from the restaurant proprietors to be able to have some outdoor dining. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, board members, have any thoughts on? Um on this topic, uh, uh, appetite for supporting it, how to proceed. Um, yeah, Eli, I'm, I might start things off. Greg, um, you you had inquiries. They were inquiries from the merchants or the or the restaurateurs, and they're interested in pursuing it in some form. If, I mean, were they calling because hey, when can we do this, or are they just asking? They were asking when we thought they might we might give them permission to start. Okay, so they're, they're looking for that, and that's in view of the, uh, uh, the liberalization of the policies that kicked in on March 1st, correct? So they know no, that, so did they know that, that at the time? 
No, so the, their inquiries were prior to um, the governor's announcement end of last week. Okay. I mean, my, my initial reaction is it, it was kind of messy. <laughs> I think I think most people felt that it was it was kind of messy. Um, I don't know what the schedule is for for, for the state to move. I, I know that March twenty second, there's some other 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 events events that may occur. I don't know if it's going to affect restaurants. Um, my my initial reaction is if we can work something on the sidewalks without involving the streets. I'm I'm all for that if 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 the if the uh, policy becomes liberal enough that they can make ends meet that way to jump into the streets again it's just yeah it makes it makes things look kind of kind of come kind of tumultuous downtown no question about it and I I prefer to the sidewalk thing if the sidewalk thing can be worked out I'm I'm in favor of looking at that first but I'm curious as to what their thoughts are in view of the new policies that have been put in place and if that can get them to uh, break even or something. If I may, um, yep. April here is not really very nice. I, mean, I, I know we'd all like it to be nice, but it really isn't. And things are changing very fast. And I'd, I'd really prefer to put off even showing an indication of direction. Um, I don't think that the town owes all of every restaurant six extra tables um, in perpetuity. Um, if, if the governor changes the rules again so that it doesn't take six, six feet, um, I don't want to find us with, with uh, <clears throat> the streets blocked and the and the um, stores upset that they their customers can't get in. Um, so I'd like to just just postpone this for another couple of weeks. Right. <clears throat> Other board members. Greg, I'd I'd like to understand whether you had heard anything from retailers, not restaurateurs. I've not heard recently from uh, from the retailers. Obviously, um, there was uh, a fair amount of concern as it extended later into the season last fall, in particular, um, just in terms of you know, the competition for that parking space. Um, so I have not heard, as I said, I haven't heard recently from them. I, uh, there is a, um, a division meeting of the Chamber of Commerce coming up. Um, I would expect this topic to come up then. Great. Um, I, I agree with Ann that April is not necessarily great, um, but people were um, out in October, which is not necessarily great for outdoor dining either, um, when the system had already been set up. Um, I mean, one thought that I have is to do something at the beginning of the, uh, the beginning of the season and then stop um, midsummer. It all depends on so many factors that have to do with um, the incidence of COVID, um, the continuation of the vaccines, um, I mean, frankly, I think the governor is moving a little bit quickly on opening everything up, um, given where we are in terms of vaccines. So I'm with Ann. I think we should wait, uh, start to think about what kinds of plans we could make, but not implement anything until um, end of April. Becky, any thoughts? Um, I do. I, I think that um, restaurants have been really hard hit by this. And, and my understanding is that retailers have had a little more time to recoup. Um, 
so I would I would like a little more information. Um, previously, the governor gave guidelines um, for certain constraints regarding outdoor dining. Greg, is there anything at this point from the governor on that? No, so we assume that the same rules that were in effect in last summer would be in play this, this spring and summer as well. Okay, until, but we hear, nothing. until we hear otherwise, but we haven't, we haven't heard anything new. Okay, I, 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 I guess also one of my thoughts on um, outdoor dining is um, I think some of the larger restaurants, it's easier for them to, um, I guess, um, um, accommodate um, patrons, whereas the smaller ones have a harder time. And um, I, I don't know who's reached out to you at this point, but I would be, um, perhaps more inclined to kind of offer the, the smaller venues um, a jump on things. Uh, but I would like to hear, I'd like um, to hear a little bit more from the governor on guidance on this. Say a little bit more uh, on the guidance, do you mean uh, about whether or not the, the state intends to continue supporting outdoor dining? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a couple of um, uh, ways we can go here. One is, um, we, regardless, I think we can go and ask the governor or ask the, the state what their plans are in terms of supporting uh, outdoor dining again this year uh, to see whether or not it's an option at all. Um, and then, uh, it seems like there's a, a consensus among board members that we don't necessarily want to jump right on board and go on outdoor dining. <clears throat> um, question is, um, should we make any effort to go and, and uh, get some more information from uh, local businesses now, or do you want to wait? And if we do it now, um, <clears throat> Uh, how do we do that? What do we do? We do it. Would we prefer to have a board member assigned to go and help with that process, or do we just want to let town staff um, send out a query? And I'll open it back up to board members. Eli, if I may. Yep. I I would like to get more information. Um, because if if this ends up seeming something that that should be acted upon, then I think it'd be good to be ready to go. Um, and with that said, unfortunately, I'm working full time right now, so I haven't got time to scoot out, which I know you know most of us are. Um, but I I would also like to get. Um, I'd like to hear Greg's take on this. What Greg's take on this? Take on this from the standpoint of of um, the people, the, the businesses that have reached out to him, and how motivated they are. Well, I would it's certainly fair to say that um, the restaurant owners are. are very motivated. Um, they they are anxious to um, have as much capacity as possible to to match their full capacity, um, and I think many of them felt that it would they would love to see it's something longer term even without COVID. I, I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how we can work on a, on a long-term game plan that could accommodate that. That's, a, that's really another question and another challenge um, um, that would be something worth working on, I think, in terms of um, just sort of the benefit of, of the restaurant tours and sort of the ambiance of town. I think 
Often mm -hmm. outdoor dining, outdoor dining can be a nice feature of a of a downtown area. Um, we we are very heavily space constrained to make that possible, but maybe there are some more creative ways to find space for it um, without without jeopardizing parking and and making it look a little uh, sort of hodgepodge or you know last minute thrown together, which mm -hmm. more or less is what we did it last last year. Um, so I think it's worth uh, continuing to work on because I do see it as something that people are interested in long-term regardless of, of COVID. Um, but uh, the more immediate need in terms of COVID, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see a little bit, uh, you know, another, another few, few weeks. Um, hopefully things are a little clearer. It, it seems that every week brings, brings some new information. So um, I think we can, we can count on new information coming in the next mm -hmm. couple, three weeks. Eli, if I may. Sure. In that case, let's, I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable just waiting till we get a little more information. Okay. Um. Okay. Eli, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, my question is, What's, what's the information that we need? Um, one would be the, whether the state's following the same guidelines as last summer, um, but what's the information that we need from local merchants and, and restaurateurs? Um, in, their, in their best interest, the restaurateurs are gonna to wanna to expand as much of their footprint as they can. Um, and we heard loud and clear from local merchants how they did not like the amount of parking spaces that were displaced last, last uh, summer and into the fall. So I guess the information that I would be looking for outside of the information from the state, me personally, um, is um, if, if restaurants uh, need this, if they um, were given scenarios where, for example, um, uh, indoor dining was essentially fully authorized by the state and the, and the distance restrictions were dropped, um, uh, do the restaurants have, um, you know, information that they can provide us that, that suggests um, whether or not their businesses would be adequately supported by that. Um, because it comes down, it does come down, back down to the issue of whether or not people actually go in there. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, and uh, I don't think the restaurants can necessarily provide that information to us, but they're probably uh, one of the best suited to provide some of that information. Um, they can tell us, you know, with, with more accuracy, the degree to which they were um, empty or in, in the degree to which they're uh, filling back up over the next uh, <clears throat> a few weeks. I think that sort of information would be useful. And yes, it's not gonna be entirely objective, um, but it's uh, information nonetheless that uh, might help us. Thank you, Rila. Well. Well, Eli, uh, yeah, let me just comment. I, 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 I'm kind of with uh, Becky in that I don't think we need to do anything right now. It's March 1st. We all agree that even April's kind of a shaky month for eating outside. Things may evolve over the next couple of weeks because now we've got a slightly different um, policy that's in place for these, these folks. So. I think that we can probably wait a couple of weeks. I, Greg, I assume when these, these folks who contacted you, they, didn't, they weren't necessarily pushing for a specific date. They just wanted to know what was going on. I think that's right, John, yes. Okay, so it's not, it's not like they say, we wanna hear back from you guys as soon as possible as to what you wanna do. 
They just uh, they, they they were just anxious to get it back on the on our radar. Well, they, on the radar, yes. Yes, I okay. think that's fair to say. Okay. Well, I'm I'm in favor of waiting a couple of weeks and seeing what happens because they're not losing any time in all of this. I also think that regardless of what happens, they're still going to want outdoor dining. I think that they found that, that there are, you know, a lot of patrons uh, perhaps kind of like that. They like to kind of see what's going on out there and whatever form that takes, I think that they probably will want to do that in some form. So um, just going back to even if, if normalcy were the case, say 60 or 90 days from now, they'll still say, well, we'd like to do, we'd like to have some sidewalk or outside dining in some form. All right. Well, we'll try and crack that particular nut um, uh, later. Uh, any objections to the town reaching out to the state to find out if they have um, uh, thought about this and, and the, their, their guidelines now as opposed to later? I, I think we should go ahead and get that information as soon as possible. Yeah. Accepting that, accepting that um, it's probably going to change three times between now and the 1st of April. Maybe. But at least we can um, keep track of it. Yeah. All right. I think we have enough. Um, um, so we'll come back to this um, in another couple of weeks and see where we stand. Um, OK. All right. And this brings us to a fine example of the topic that I raised when I first started the meeting when I, I seem to remember that we actually originally planned for a slightly less time for this discussion. I now have a few minutes where um, I have to fill the gap. So I'm going to pull the uh, item number five, the consent agenda um, up because we can't start the tobacco woods presentation quite yet. On the consent agenda, we have board of selectmen meeting minutes from February 16th and a letter of resignation from Ryan Ackerman from the Welcome to Manchester Committee. Uh, members of the board have any comments on the items in the consent agenda? I got a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Jakes? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Durant? Yes. Mr. Bodden returning? Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. Next item is correspondence. We have a letter from <clears throat> the Mass DOT regarding our chapter 90 funding for um, fiscal year 2022. Um, <clears throat> and a letter from the Health and Human, uh, Human Services Secretary Suters regarding the state vaccination distribution. Um, any questions or comments on those from the board? I'll mention that the chapter 70 um, number for the town um, for fiscal year 2021 is uh, 140,000. Is that a typo? Uh, 140,763 dollars. <throat> um, okay, any questions from board members on the um, consent on the correspondence? I, d I had one question whether that uh... 140K is up or down from last year? Greg? Uh, it's level. Same, level? Same, same, same amount. Okay. okay so it's, so it's, given it's, what it will buy, it's down. <laughs> yes, correct. Um, it's, it typically stays flat for a number of years, and then there's a lot of gnashing of teeth, and then you might get a little bit of little bump for, and then it stays flat again. And, that's typically how it goes. Thank you, Greg. All right. Well, that was about perfect. It's 60 to 55 now. So we can take up item number two on the agenda, which is Tobacco Woods Road presentation. So this is a presentation on a proposal uh, or a request from Hamilton to relocate um, part of Tobacco Woods Road. Um, uh, tonight, we're going to have a presentation 
um, from, I believe, Ward and Kern um, on this. Um, uh, Ken Mavrigeorge, are you the one going to be presenting this? I am, yes. OK. Um, <clears throat> so um, if we end up, uh, so in order to do this uh, uh, shift of the road, um, assuming that we approve it, this is, this is something that will go to a town meeting vote, just so people are aware. So there's going to be um, uh, plenty of time for there to be discussion around this. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Mavra George, do you have a, a, a PowerPoint or anything that you're going to be presenting tonight? I, I do. I have um, a, a very short presentation. Uh, if I can grab control of the screen, I can uh, I share it with you. I was just group. about to give you that. Boy, All right. That's why. Okay. All right. So, that's two. so hopefully, let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. And, and you see the uh, presentation? Yep. Okay. So um, first and foremost, thank you for uh, having us here uh, this evening. Um, I, I promise this will be really quick. Um, uh, as was mentioned, this project is uh, the reconstruction or, or partial reconstruction of Chebacco Road. Uh, we're going to do a quick overview of the project, talk about the portion that's relocated or proposed to be relocated. Um, as it is located on Manchester by the Sea property in the town of Hamilton. Um, and then we'll go into a brief summary of what the project, what we've done to date in the project, and then what the next steps are. Um, if there's time, we're happy to answer any questions that, that there may be. So first off, the, the goals of this particular project are to improve the condition of the paved roadway surface. Um, we do have a couple of photos. Um, of the project area, and you can see that the pavement will be um, is in is in complete disrepair. Um, it's really in the goal here is to improve the safety of the vehicles by improving the paved surface, maintaining a country road feel. It does have some twists and turns to it that that are desirable. Um, limit impacting the woods and native species that are in the area. That's a, that's a critical component here of, as well all while reducing sediment runoff from the gravel road and improving stormwater management where, where we can. Um, and then one of the, the, the key components that applies to the Manchester by the sea is moving of the gravel road or the roadway itself away from Gravelly Pond, which is uh, a source of drinking water for the town. So the start of the project is up at Essex Street, um, at the top left of this image. And it, and it goes all the way down to the, just by, just past the um, landfill solar development and the uh, waste or the uh, water drinking plant um, at the intersection of Pine, uh, right at the town line of Manchester by the sea. It's approximately 10,670 linear feet of roadway. And this gives you a clearer picture as to what the different components of the project. So you'll see the orange or yellow line on your screen is, is just a mill and overlay. And that's a currently paved roadway surface. Um, the green area is a currently gravel road uh, with a portion of that gravel road located um, close to uh, close to Gravelly Pond. I'll highlight it here with my mouse if you can see it. Um, but that's roughly 3,375 feet of current gravel road that will be paved at the end of this project. About 2,100 um, linear feet will be uh, paved with within the existing limits of, of Chewbacca Road. So another component of this, which is fully located within the town of Hamilton, is, is some retaining wall work to, to repair some of the uh, couple of the retaining walls located against Beck Pond, uh, roughly 15 linear feet each. Uh, we'd be replacing it with approximately 60 linear feet, again, just to shore up the, the roadway itself. As mentioned, there's there's a component of this project that is there's truly uh, important to Manchester by the Sea is interest. Uh, this portion in red that you can see on the screen is a gravel road located up against Gravelly Pond, located on what is currently Manchester by the Sea conservation restricted area. Um, it was the original location of Chebacco Road uh, back in the '60s. The the two towns got 
had an agreement to relocate a portion, this portion of Chewbacca Road into what is the, what is shown as the yellow stripe, uh, the yellow right of way on this plan. Um, from the mid 60s, it was designated as the, the right of way, but the roadway was never relocated or, or constructed there. Um, we've, as part of this project, we did conduct some geotechnical explorations in there to see if it would be a, a viable option for the relocation. Um, but after the consideration, there's, there's significant amounts of shallow ledge, uh, as well as as well as um, the proximity of that right of way to the adjacent properties, um, you can see just to the right of, of that yellow line. So what we're here to talk about is, is developing what is shown in here is the green line, which is sort of what we think is a happy medium between the two. It still achieves the goal of moving the road further away from Gravelly Pond, and thus improve, hopefully improving the water quality, but also uh, getting you know a, a new paved surface in, in creating more contiguous conservation area up against Gravelly Pond. So as I mentioned, there's just some photos of the area. This is the, of, of the roadway itself. This is the transition between the paved surface and the gravel road. And you'll see this is the grip, this is the portion on your screen off to the right here is the gravel road as it heads towards Gravelly Pond. And the, the trees uh, that you see here with the red reflector in the center of your screen is the portion where the road would be, is proposed currently. And just to the left is the 1964 right of way. So a little bit further diving deeper into this, um, the town of Ham Hamilton holds two established right of ways, the 40 foot right of way, which is where the current road is located, the 40 foot 1964 right of way, which hasn't been used as stated, the goal is to move the project, move the roadway and pave the roadway so that it's not close to Gravelly Pond. Uh, as mentioned, it's a surface water reservoir, drinking source for uh, the, the town. You know, geotechnical explorations, a lot of back and forth, a lot of conceptual designs. Uh, and we, what we feel, and you'll see in the next slide, is really uh, the, the, the alternative that, that we feel works best. Um, so what you see here is just a zoomed in area. The, the light blue area on the top of your screen is the 1964 right of way. And you can see it, it creates a, a straighter shot uh, connecting what is a gravel road on the right hand side to the paved surface on the left. Um, but as you'll note in the top of your screen, there are some private properties with a driveway in here, which makes construction a lot more difficult and challenging. Um, the red is the proposed roadway the configuration that we're seeking uh, your approval from. And then the green area in the bottom is the existing roadway right of way that would be uh, transferred back into conservation or restored back into truly conservation uh, uh, area. So this next page just kind of gives you an idea of what we're what we're seeking to do with this project. The area that we just showed on that previous plan in light blue 1964 right of way would be transferred back from uh, back to the Manchester by the sea uh, control and into the conservation area. It's roughly 40, just under 45,000 square feet. The existing right of way that is along uh, closest to, gra uh, to Gravelly Pond would also be uh, reverted back into conservation land uh, by allowing the compacted gravels by removing some of the, or stirring up some of the compacted gravels and restoring it back to a uh, loaming and seeding and letting it go back naturally to a wooded uh, condition. And then what we're seeking in return from that or what the town of Hamilton is seeking in return for that is the 33,000, just under 34,000 square feet of a proposed permanent easement for the relocation, relocated portion of the road. The net total area would be um, just under 43,000 square feet uh, to the benefit of Manchester by the sea in in expanded conservation area with this proposal. So I just wanna go back to one slide and, and kind of touch on that again, but the light blue area right now, it's currently a right of way in favor of Hamilton. With this project, we are seeking to put that back into the control of Manchester by the sea. Uh, and that would be part of the conservation. And, and if you were to walk out there today, you'd note that it's currently undisturbed area. 
the green area would also be returned back into conservation area um, by restoring as much as we can uh, to allow it to revert back to a wooded area. And in exchange, we would look for that red area um, to be a, a right of way easement uh, to the benefit of Hamilton. Uh, there is a fourth color on here that I, I do want to make sure I point out, but it is in yellow, and that would be the grading that we feel is necessary in order to construct the road itself. Uh, roughly, you know, the whole swath is about 50 feet wide. Uh, we feel that that's sufficient room for them to to build and construct this road. Um, it would it, the red area that you see there does have some drainage associated with it, some drainage swale, roadside swale. Uh, so this, the area in red would be maintained uh, by the town of Hamilton uh, to make sure that their road uh, operates uh, safely and, and appropriately. Uh, and the yellow would, once the construction is done, the yellow area would revert back into the conservation area uh, under the control of Manchester by the sea. So this is, this is kind of why we're doing this and why we're here this evening is that even though the property is located in the town of Hamilton, um, it is subjected to the conservation restriction as a conser conservation restriction area uh, as part of the Massachusetts general law. And thus any proposed land transfer is covered under article 97 of the Massachusetts constitution. Um, and, and thus we're starting the process. We're, we're here tonight to to talk to you about our next steps in the process and, and, and as was noted earlier about the you know th this would have to come up for vote uh, at the at the annual town meeting uh, as it would at the annual Hamilton town meeting um, and we'll get into the next steps in, in the next couple of slides so project status uh, town of Hamilton we we did present at the conservation commission about a month ago or a couple months ago um, and were issued an order conditions for the project. Uh, we've submitted an ENF to the state to, to the uh, Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act office in June of 2020 um, and we are still coordinating with them to make sure that we've addressed all their comments. Um, it, we're currently in the process of working with the town of Hamilton to wrap up the project plans, specifications, and other bid documents to get them ready for construction. Uh, and at this point, we anticipate uh, a, a bidding process uh, between May and June. Um, that might extend a little bit, but we're hoping to, to have this project out to bid in, in the next, in the early summer, late spring, early summer, with construction uh, later this year, um, with a wrap up hopefully by the end of the year. So I alluded to it earlier, but the next steps of this project, you know, our meeting tonight here with, with the Board of Selectmen, um, you know, we're, we anticipate another meeting with the general public, uh, the neighbors and the abutters in the town of Hamilton later this month um, or early in April. At this point, it, you know, with your, you know, with your support, we would, we would uh, work with the town of Hamilton and in the, in the town of Manchester by the sea to, to draft formal article 97 documents uh, over the next couple of months again to in, to line us up to to uh, be on the both agendas for the May uh, 2021 town meetings uh, over that time we'd say uh, we expect that the final legislation would be drafted uh, for a vote in in early summer of 2021 with the start of construction of uh, middle of summer July 2020 so that's really um, a, a quick overview of the project and uh, the status and the next steps. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the project. Okay, one quick comment and sure. uh, one question and I'm turning over to the rest of the board members. So um, comment is our town meeting is not gonna be in May, it's gonna be in the tail end of June. Okay. Uh, uh, so I don't know how that, uh, plays in with your time frames, but that's just how it's gonna be. Sure. Um, second, um, can you go back to the map, the larger, higher, higher level map with the yellow line on it, which shows the existing road? There you go. Sure. Um, so the project end uh, uh, starts just after the transfer station. That's gonna leave a little segment of the road that remains unpaved, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it, it, the, the limit of the paved section would be at the town line. 
And can you indicate on that map uh, uh, roughly where that is, uh, both for us and for uh, the public to see? Sure, I believe it's it's right around here. If you can see my cursor, um, and I and I believe there's the unpaved section. Maybe it, it may be just a few hundred feet from the town line down to uh, down to the transfer station. I believe. I think that's what the limits are. Okay. All right. Um, uh, questions from board members. I do have some if nobody else. Um, the time of year that you all are talking about, and I'm sure the con cons would weigh in on this, but um, the, the time, do we know when the amphibians or reptiles in that area are out and in the middle of the roads crossing to get from one to another pond? That's a, that's a good question. I, I don't have the the answer. We could certainly look into it. Um, I, we do have a, an environmental and a wetland scientist uh, working with us on the, on the project, um, and and there are a number of um, uh, areas in the project that are hopefully going to improve the conditions out there for uh, the wildlife. Um, a portion of the road actually relocate that's going to be reconstructed closer to Manchester by the sea um, is located in in, in a, you know uh, in a, extra sensor, uh, sensitive habitat area um, where uh, we're in talking with the Conservation Commission, we wanna put in additional signage. Uh, we we wanna take extra precautions where we can, um, but it's certainly something we can, we can ask our wetland scientists and environmental scientists to, uh, to assist us with as we move forward. Um, so you also mentioned um, in the information you sent that there would be tunnels to accommodate um, the moving of, of I, it, some of these animals. Does that mean the roadway would be, would be elevated at all or how is this achieved? Sure, so, so right now the proposed project, the yellow portion of the project is just a mill and overlay. They'll, they'll ride off an inch and a half and then they'll pave over. So there shouldn't be any change in, in physical footprint of the paved surface and the elevation of the paved surface. So what, what's there today is essentially what we'll, you'll see in the future, just looks better. Um, on the green section, uh, there will be a full depth reconstruction. You know, we had our geotechnical engineers do a number of uh, borings out there um, to determine what a proper section would be. Um, but again, some of this area is located within a, a FEMA flood, uh, flood map zone. Um, so we wanna make sure and pay extra careful attention that we're not raising the elevation on the road um, what we, what I think is being referred to um, as the tunnels are that there's a couple of culverts uh, located along the project. Um, you know, the intent would be is that that these culverts, if they're in poor shape, um, they may be, uh, they may need to be reconstructed or repaired. Um, if during construction they're deemed um, uh, not viable or salvageable, um, but there is a right sort of at the transition of current paved and gravel road, there is a trench drain uh, that was designed to uh, act as a salamander crossing or um, a small amphibian crossing. Um, it's currently completely filled with sediment. Um, and I think I actually have a photo of it um, right here. So if, if you could see on the screen, um, you see this, this trench drain is buried with sediment right now. And, and what this is, this is a result. It's located just down, just behind the camera, off, off the camera uh, from the gravel road portion, which is really why, well, another driving reason why we, besides safety and having a paved road, which is safer, uh, smoother, um, but it, it does allow a lot of sediment to wash off. And what the result of that is, is that it fills in uh, culverts and, and amphibian crossings like that. Um, so ultimately, at the end of the day, when this project is done, it's paved, um, we're hoping that that amphibian crossing stays open for the long term and requires less maintenance. So um, in, in addition to I, that, um, and I'm just curious, is there, do, you, do we know why the road was put where it was as opposed to where the right of way was? 
I mean, I, I, I think the, the the existing location of the road um, is the original. I think that has to be the original location. It doesn't appear that there's any um, former right of way that was that it was moved closer to Gravelly Pond. Um, okay. I, I think what we what we gather is that in 1964 these same discussions were being had. Um, they wanted to move the road away from Gravelly Pond, um, straighten it out. Certainly that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, when you look at the area that it's located in, uh, that, that 1964 right of way, there's a lot of large ledge outcroppings. Um, and uh, it actually creates a, a kind of a straightaway um, that we heard feedback from a lot of residents that there's concern about, right? If, it's, if, mm -hmm. if it turns into a, um, a speedway. So what we're trying to do with the green area that you can see on your screen is, is try to maintain a, a, a country type feel, country road type feel, but also get the benefits of moving it away uh, from resource areas and buffers. Okay, thank you. I just have a couple more questions. Um, sure. um, do we know approximately how many trees will be taken out? And in addition to that, will there be any trees planted in the area where the road is um, being removed? Um, I, I don't have an exact count as to how many trees would be removed. Um, there would be uh, there would be a, a number of trees cut from this particular area um, to to build this road um, or along the project itself. There there are a number of um, dead or dying trees um, that would also have to be removed, um, and, and they'll be removed in, in terms of visibility to improve visibility around corners um, on the gravel portion. That's not shown on your screen but on the gravel portion of the road um, there are some trees on the side of the road uh, that are in less than ideal conditions and they're quite large um, but in particular in this location i don't have a, a, a solid number at this point are there any uh old growth or heritage trees that that would be taken out for that or is, is the all the trees look relatively I and mean, they're all you know, 24 inches or less. I mean, in, in the vast majority of them, um, if we were to walk out there, the vast majority are maybe even six inches or less. They're 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 quite small in nature. Um, there there is the occasional, and you know, our plants, our design plants, do have uh, trees above uh, 14 inches or so identified, uh, and and there aren't uh, as many as, as one would expect in this area. Um. And I get my last question really has to do with um, the motivation to do this. Is there any reason why this is brought up now that you know of? Um, that That's a good question. I, I do know that there was, um, I think this has been an action item for the town for a while um, in that, you know, certainly 1964, there was a, a right of way granted. And at, at some point, uh, the town is is maintaining a gravel road, which is less than ideal. Um, you know, if we consider uh, that the, some of the feedback we've heard from residents so far is that mail trucks can't get out there. Um, you know, the, the old saying about the weather can't keep the mail trucks from delivering the mail, but a, a, a poor shape, uh, poor condition of a gravel road could, um, you know, school buses, emergency vehicles, it makes it really difficult for residents to get those services. Um, and, and I think over the time, over time, you know, the winter maintenance really does add up. Um, the winter, if we went out there, uh, a lot of the roads are ponding water, they're com densely compacted. Um, continuous plowing pushes the gravel to the sides of the road, um, which, you know, ultimately in this area, there's wetlands right up to the edge of the pavement and up to the edge of the gravel road. So as the town maintains more and more, you're creating more of an, you're creating conditions that are uh, less and less sustainable and, and, and potentially could cause harm to those, those wetland areas. So we're trying to find, um, I think that, again, without speaking directly for the town, I think a lot of those things are sort of building up over time. And, and now this is a great time to, to try to improve the situation and, and create a win-win for uh, as many parties as they can. So the neighbors are um, enthusiastic about this. Um, I th I think they're 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 very I think 
portions of this, I think they're enthusiastic about. Um, I think there's still, in, in hence why we have another public meeting that we're going to uh, present. Um, initially, the first public meeting we had showed the road going in the yellow right of way. And the feedback we got was, it's extremely close to their properties. There's concern for speeds, trying to maintain that country feel. Um, so we're trying to work with them and try to find, like like we said earlier, a happy medium here. Um, you know, so I, I think a lot of them would love to see it paved. Um, this was put up for town vote, I believe, in 2019, um, and supported by the town to pave it. Um, and as you can see from those other photos I showed, uh, paving this road would would result in a significant improvement over the amount of sediment in gravelly pond and in wetland areas. So um, I think I think it's it's been overwhelmingly supported supported by the town of Hamilton residents. Thank you very much, Ken. I appreciate your um, sure. answers. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the questions. I've got I've got a question or two, uh, sure. Eli or Ken. Sure. Can Go you? Ahead. Okay, good. <laughs> have, have you is is this uh, kind of the first presentation or discussion of this project with Manchester? And I, really specifically, I'm asking: Have you been in touch with our Department of Public Works on this? Um, I, I believe I'm. I'm not sure if Tim uh, Tim Olson's on here, the director, of the DPW. I'm on here, Ken. I'm right. on here. <laughs> All right, Tim. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it to Tim if if you wouldn't mind, Tim, uh, maybe giving a little background as to your contacts with the Manchester by the Sea folks. Sure. Yeah, and and it, before before you start in, in that context, I'm I'm curious. I, I think there've been that that road, the whole length of the road has been maintained, I guess, periodically with a road grader or something. I, I mean, I've been up and down it, and sometimes it's potholes, and sometimes it's pretty good, but uh, it depends on your timing. And I'm curious how that has been maintained, and I nice. and and also doing the math here. You said 3,300 feet is unpaved and 2,100 feet will be paved. I assume that's the entire length that is in Hamilton, which would leave about 2,200 feet, or excuse me, 1,200 feet that is in Manchester. So, well, so, so the whole project, uh, Tim, just before you jump in there, I, I think the, all the, the whole project is located within Hamilton. Uh, yes, 2,100 2100 feet is going to be repaved, or is going to be rebuilt and paved in its current configuration. Uh, that remaining 1,300 feet or so is the portion that would be relocated. Um, oh, okay. On right. Sorry, I, 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 I wasn't I, sure how that math was yeah. working. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's it's currently within resource area buffers, um, uh, 1,200 feet or so. Actually, it's, it's on the screen right here. Um, the red line is about 1,200 square feet, and because both roads are curved, it's sort of a wash. What the new road will uh, mimic the the length of the existing road. Uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Tim so he can uh, sure. speak a little bit more about the maintenance and contacts with Manchester by the Sea folks. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time tonight. Uh, this is Tim Olson, DPW director in Hamilton. Uh, I've been in contact with uh, Manchester's DPW uh, periodically over. I've been in Hamilton for the last four years. Uh, a lot of our conversations that we've had um, more so are wondering when we're going to regrade the roadway. Uh, I think uh, if, I'm, um, if I'm correct, I believe you guys have um, consultants that run the water treatment plant that's out there. Um, I'm not sure if that's their um, way of travel, um, but it, it has come to my attention several times to have the road regraded due to the poor conditions. Um, our guys, uh, they do a pretty good job. I mean, we don't have a grader. Uh, on on our in our fleet we have a, a loader um and so a lot of what we do is you know we band-aid the roadway we if there's potholes or or large um you know um problem areas we do bring in material we back drag we level out and we make the road passable um in the winter time it's kind of challenging because it is a resource area we do not use salt out there um so we are trying to play the game with uh, the snow and the ice and the conditions out there um, as best we can without using material. Um, but we know we try to keep it passable. Our main concern is that we have uh, the Hamilton landfill out there that we open for brush days uh, for residents. We also have the Rod and Gun Club out there. Uh, we also have a new solar array um, at our landfill and uh, we use, DPW uses that as a stock area 
uh, stockpile area. So we do have, um, you know, municipal use uh, and committees and groups that use that area. We also have that road that's heavily traveled for recreational area to the Tobacco Lake, uh, to the boat launch, things like that. So, you know, it's one of three roads that we have in Hamilton that are public roadways that are gravel. Um, they are all a little different, but a, a large maintenance um, tasks. They do take up quite a bit of time as well as as, as funding um, to maintain those roadways. And, you know, you're correct. If, if we have a, we, we get the, we just get the road done and maybe a week and a half, two weeks later, we get a rainstorm and everything that we've just done for the last two or three days is, is, is all for nothing. Uh, so this, you know, by paving the roadway, we take away the maintenance, but we also add the, the you know, a nice safe traveled roadway. That's, that's my job in town to, you know, to create that and to maintain that. Um, so, you know, we take away that whole uh, response issue, uh, public safety response. We've had uh, problems in the past with ambulances, uh, fire, um, like Ken said, mail trucks. Uh, so what we're trying to do is tr trying to create the road, a, a nice, safe, traveled town public roadway um, through, you know, through that area and then maintain uh, or I guess properly maintenance the other paved section uh, that's in in fair shape, but uh, can use an um, inch and a half overlay. Uh, so we're just trying to create in continuity the whole nice project uh, from Essex Street to uh, Wenham Hamilton Town Line. I don't know if that answers all your questions, but I'm here if you have any others. Okay. So well, my. Initial question. So have, so have you spoken with our, our Department of Public Works and are they aware that you're you have this project in near term consideration? So I've, I've talked with Greg uh, through our town manager, okay. uh, Joe Domalovitz. I've talked with Greg Federspiel, um, your your town administrator. And yep. I have talked to Chuck Dam. Uh, I believe it was through email. Um, you know, that was way back, you know, a little bit ago. I've been waiting to get to this point uh, to keep him updated um, going through our, our CONCOM and, uh, you know, public presentations as well as sitting here tonight with you. Um, so I'm just trying to give him updates, uh, but I have touched base with him. Like I said, I, I, I think we did talk uh, briefly about trying to maybe bring on the rest of the paving as part of this project. Um, you know, through in, Ham in Hamilton and then into Manchester. Um, but those are conversations that we have to have again uh, as we get further with this project, knowing that it was going to be a kind of a longer term, uh, you know, with the permitting as well as the conservation restriction. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I haven't heard anything negative from him, so. In progress. Yep. Other board members? Um, if I may, yeah. I thought I saw um, an article recently about a proposed development at the junction of Essex Street and Tobacco Road. Does that have any, um, is that any part of this consideration? To it give? is not. Uh, that project is brand new. This project has been going on for about, well, a long time, but since I've been here for several years now, we're trying to get this project done. So that project came in after this project was already underway. Thank you. Eli? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is um, you paved this road and uh, what uh, thought has gone into speed mitigation and speed limits on the road um, for people traveling along the road. Sure. So uh, one of the things we looked at um, when deciding, so again, the, the first 7,000 or so feet of roadway would be milled and overlaid. Um, essentially, whatever the width of the road is, uh, maintain that width, whatever uh, the elevation of the road is, maintain that elevation. Uh, the last 3,000 or so feet uh, from, Pine, from Pond Street down to the Manchester town line, um, we're looking at complete full depth reconstruction of the road. Um, 
and with that what we're doing is is instead of having a roadway that varies in width from 17 to 22 or greater feet which is what the gravel road does today is restricting the pavement edge of pavement to edge of pavement uh, to, to 20 feet wide um, there wouldn't be a center line uh, but but it having narrower roadway uh, with some um, fog lines on the outside uh, does promote uh, slower speeds in the area uh, does give sufficient room for vehicles to move uh, beyond each other, um, but but have a maintain that lower uh, speed limit that currently exists out there. Um, you know, one thing we we mentioned uh, a number of times with with all of our presentations um, has been the desire of the town to maintain that country feel. Um, you know, hearing that the the residents in the area don't want a speedway. Right, they don't want this straight runway of straight, uh, uh, like you see in the screen, the uh, the light blue. Uh, it, it's almost a a runway of sorts. So, by keeping some of those softer curves in there, um, it promotes vehicles to, to take uh, a small a slower speed around in the area. Um, one of the items that was brought up earlier was the the veget the uh, amphibians and the the wildlife that exists in the area. Um, we're also providing some signage there to encourage travelers to, to slow down, uh, knowing that there are animals and, and wildlife that are passing. Um, so there's a number of measures that we're looking at, uh, including additional signage, slow adding curves into the road, um, and narrower travel widths where we can safely uh, to promote uh, slower speeds. In that regard, um... Have you done any kind of traffic study that uh, looks at um, diversion of traffic off of 128 um, coming this way rather than going up to um, Southern Ave or uh, getting off on 22? It, it, there was no uh, formal traffic study completed as part of this. Uh, primary goal and objective of this project is to uh, to pave the road, uh, reduce the amount of gravel, uh, reduce and, and uh, try to limit the amount of sediment transporting off the site. So there's been no consideration of changes in traffic flows off of 128? Not as part of this project, no. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, so as we said before, this has got to go to a town meeting vote um, uh, if, we, if we proceed on it. And um, so there's gonna be time for us to be um, uh, soliciting public input. <clears throat> and I'll um, uh, leave some time opening in a future meeting to um, uh, ask public to um, comment or ask questions. Um, um, so Eli, if I might? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Um, so Ken, could you just give a quick summary of the, the, the Hamilton's Conservation Commission review and conditions that they may have placed? Sure, so the, the review uh, generally focused on, um, you know, the, as was discussed just a moment ago, uh, wildlife uh, passage. Um, we heard from a number of butters in the area uh, about concerns on the wildlife passage. Um, I, I don't believe, and again, I don't have the uh, border conditions right up here in front of me, but um, it, there were, uh, it, it didn't appear that there's any conditions or, or drastic changes to the plans uh, that you see here, uh, specifically related to the relocation of the road. Um, I think to summarize it, generally they were supportive of the, the paving of the roadway um, as it is seen as an improvement over uh, the current condition. Um, any chance to move roadway away from resource areas um, or uh, provide some stormwater management, um, which in this case, we, we are trying to do some improvements in stormwater. Um, it was generally, uh, you know, thought highly of, of the project itself is that it's, it's, it's doing what it can in a tricky situation. 
Um, I think what's noted, noticeable uh, or notable about this project in that we are we we're trying to work within the constraints of the roadway. Um, there's narrow right of ways. There's significant amount of vegetation. Um, you know, wetlands are right up against the road, and and as we noted, there's there is some wildlife habitat all throughout this area. Um, so trying to do all of these measures um, by by also taking into consideration all of those constraints. Um, uh, I think overall, they were pretty, pretty happy with the design, um, as opposed to clearing a, a large significant amount of trees and putting in detention ponds, um, you know, that that can, that uh, would be less likely to be maintained in the long term. And Greg, if you if you wanted a copy of those order conditions, I can send them over to you. That'd be great too. Thank you. Okay, sure. All right. Um, so, I think I'm going to say thank you for your presentation tonight. But I'm going to ask you to hang on for one minute because another thought has occurred to me here. Sure. So it is. Um, 7.35, 7.36 now. We had originally scheduled on our agenda um, 40B project update at 7.15, then going into the annual town meeting discussion at 7.30. Um, Alan Wilson, uh, was it your intent to uh, listen to both of those or were you here primarily for the annual town meeting updates? Well, I was gonna listen to both, um, but I'm here primarily for the annual town meeting update. So if, if you're thinking about taking them out of order, I, I'll probably stay on for both, but I would appreciate you doing that. Yeah, uh, and I, I was, and one of the reasons I was thinking taking it out of order is because one facet of this um, uh, discussion was the need for an annual town meeting vote. And I thought that perhaps uh, while we have, um, uh, folks from the project here, it might be worth diving into the annual town meeting discussion and discuss the logistics around such a vote very briefly at the beginning of that. What do you think about that, Alan? I, I think that's fine. Other board members okay with doing that? Yes. All right, let's do that. So um, let's discuss what that annual town meeting vote would actually be and discuss the logistics and the voting requirements um, and possible outcomes. Uh, so, Greg, uh, can you uh, be more give us some specifics around what the vote would be actually be? So, voters would need to approve abandoning um, the two current right of ways and approving the new one. So, they'd be. The, the vote would be to abandon the blue and the green and to accept the red as a new right-of-way and to seek um, legislative approval uh, under the Article 97 provisions. And, and I, I, haven't, I haven't researched it, Greg, you may know, but I believe that all three of those would require a two-thirds vote the abandoning, abandoning of the existing right of ways because there'd be a transfer of an interest in real estate and the um, a transfer of the new right of way because it would be a transfer of conservation land. I believe that's correct, Alan. I, I haven't and confirmed I, that. But sub, I think subject to checking, but I think that's right. Yes. And the Article 97 work with the state, is that pro forma or is that something that we would have to proceed, pursue and lobby for? I think it, generally if the town approves it, it's pretty much pro forma. It, in, in this particular case, since, since we're gaining conservation land um, and, and providing some benefit, additional benefit to, to Gravelly Pond, I'm not anticipating uh, much opposition. Um, it's not pro forma if you're if you're not uh, if you're decreasing conservation land. So in that case, it's it's it can be an uphill uh, uphill battle. 
Um, I'm not anticipating that in this case. I don't know if, if Hamilton folks have, have had a, have had any preliminary conversations with uh, with Bruce or Brad yet or not. But, um, yeah, Greg, we have we've sent out some pre, uh, some preliminary emails uh, to Senator Tarr and Rep, uh, Representative Brad Hill. Uh, getting them uh, prepared. Uh, they have done these uh, chapter 97s in the past. They, they have informed us. Um, I just wanted to really quickly, I know we're wrapping this up a little bit. I just want to quickly bring up where Hamilton's been um, kind of through this project. We, we did, as Ken mentioned earlier, we did go to town meeting back in, I think in 2019, the town overwhelmingly voted in support of this project for a million dollars uh, to get this road paved. So it wasn't, it's just not a group of people. It's not a DPW project. Um, it's not a town manager project. The town voted in support of this at town meeting uh, and funded a million dollars for this project. So we asked, you know, just, I'm just bringing that up to Manchester, uh, just so you know that it's a town of Hamilton's uh, wish to get this road paved, not a DPW, not a town manager. Um, it's a it's a town wide um, recommendation. So I just want to let you know that. Thing. Just to go back to un underscore what Greg said, in, in addition to the net gain of conservation land in terms of square footage, the fact that the road is being moved further away from the water resource area Correct. Uh, weighs significantly in its favor under Article 97, I think. Do you agree, Greg? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. So, um, seems uh, obviously we're going to gather, you know, public opinion. Seems likely that we'll be discussing this annual town meeting. Um, uh, I don't know how lengthy that conversation will be. Um, I guess it will be helped if we do a certain amount of public outreach before we get to town meeting on the subject. Any thoughts on that from the board? Eli? Yeah, go ahead, Becky. Would we, um, would it make sense also to have um, a representative from um, their town be in attendance to answer questions as well? It's probably not a bad idea, Alan. That's uh, your meeting, so. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, if perhaps. Um, we, we can make that happen. If, I if, mean, I'm, I'm available and I can talk to Ken offline. Yeah, we can. I, think, I think if Tim and Ken were both available, that would be helpful. Sure, we can get you, uh, in, in the meantime, we can certainly get you a, a PDF version of the presentation um, to, to post or share uh, with constituents. That would be a good idea. All right. Uh, well, can we let uh, Woodard and Curran and, and Hamilton people go now? Any other, other um, or questions from board members for them before they go? Alan. Sorry? You all, all set with Hamilton, Alan? I, I think so. Thank you both very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Well, thanks very much, Alan. We'll uh, be in touch with you soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. All right. Um, <clears throat> On the remaining town articles, uh, there were, we touched briefly on, oh, I'm sorry. Um, why don't we talk about the date first? Because <clears throat> we did say that we were going to um, commit on the date at this meeting. Right now we've gotten feedback from the state uh, school that uh, June 21st and June 23rd as a backup date uh, will be fine. Uh, so that would be Monday, I get that right, Monday, June 21st, and Wednesday, uh, 
June 23rd for a rain date. Um, so tonight, what uh, I'd like is to um, see if the board have any, any further comments on that, and then we can make a vote to uh, um, move the date of town meeting to June 21st. So, comments? All right, well, then can I get a motion to under Massachusetts General Law chapter 39, section nine to move the Manchester by the Sea annual town meeting for uh, 2021 to June 21st um, with a rain date of June 23rd. Alan, do we need a time on that one or do you, do you just specify the date? Um, I, I, I think it would probably be well to specify the time as well. I don't know you're, you're, that it's required. Yeah, I mean, certainly the warrant will have the time. So we will have that posted, but it, it doesn't hurt, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary right now. Well, I think we met at 6.30 last, last year. Yes, I think that's right. Are you comfortable with that time again, Alan? Well, you know, the earlier we start, the longer we're gonna have daylight. Not, I mean, the field's lighted, but but daylight is better. If, if we, we had some hesitancy last year be, uh, because of accommodating commuters, I don't know that many people are commuting at this stage. So if, if I, 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 I will leave it up to the board, but we, it could be six, maybe 6.30, either one. Board members, six or 6.30? Six. I would say 6.30 to, uh, to get to accommodate people who are commuting and you're plunking this down right on the solstice so it's the longest night of the year I and mean, longest day of the year. It, it, it was the second longest day last year too and we had fog coming in before the meeting ended. <laughs> but I'm happy with either one, either time. John Brown. I'm good. I'm good with either time as well, Eli. I lean towards six thirty because I do think there are um, commuters still in play. Fine. All right. So, can I get a motion? That, so moved. Uh, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Roll call vote. Ms. Jakes. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Mr. Bob Returner. Yes. Mr. Bowling votes yes. All right. So June 21st, 6:30 p.m. Rain date on June 23rd. And uh, uh, yep. All right. Um, <clears throat> articles. So there were three articles uh, left over from last year. Um, one. Uh, Two of them were uh, uh, was recommended that we push them out to um, uh, the fall town meeting. One of them was the um, uh, short-term uh, rental tax law, and the other was um, has escaped me. Greg, which one was it? Um, I'm sorry, I was looking at my notes. You were asking what. So that we had three laws last year that we had deferred, and uh, we're going to defer again some of them at least to uh, the uh, fall town meeting. One of them was the short term rental tax law. Uh, one was the, um, um, the, the water, uh, water and sewer uh, lien on yep. rental properties. Yep. And then the other one was. <laughs> God. Can't remember. Uh, sprinklers. Sprinklers. Thank you. Sprinklers. Um, 
<laughs> conjugate living facilities. So those two, we, we talked about moving those out to the fall town meeting. The other one was the tax liens, um, uh, uh, allowing us to go to the property owners for um, outstanding tax liens for water and sewer bills, for example. Is there any, um, uh, and that one actually we could potentially do in the Springtown meeting, uh, but do board members have any particularly strong feelings about whether or not we should push those out to uh, fall town meeting or do you want to take up any of them in the Springtown meeting? My feeling is the shorter the better for the Springtown meeting, just because it, it's hard to communicate. We don't have um, the audio visual, the visual stuff that we would have at the, in the fall. So I would favor pushing all three of those out. I agree with Dan. John? Yes. I think um, the shorter the better. That's correct. Ann said it right at the beginning. Jeff? I'll go with the board. All right. Okay. Then uh, I don't think we need to vote on that. We only need to vote if we're going to include. So um, then the other item was um, there was a, a petition from the planning board regarding uh, planning board configuration. And uh, right now the recommendation is to move that out to the fall town meeting as well, because that's likely to generate more um, discussion. And we're trying to keep things shorter. Board members agree on that one as well? Yes. Yes. And says yes, Jeff. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, other articles that need to be discussed tonight, Greg? Uh, no, I don't believe I believe so. No, you handled the, the critical ones. So um, you can move on from that. Alan, you good on those? Absolutely. I, I, I it's it's obviously your your call as a board, but I um, am all in favor of making it as short as possible while we're still in the pandemic. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, if we receive citizen petitions for other articles. Um, will we be required to hear those at the Springtown meeting? Yes, if they're, if they're given to us within uh, 60 days ahead of the um, uh, new date for the annual town meeting, uh, we're required to put them on the agenda, on the warrant. Regardless of how many there are. That is correct. Okay, any other um, questions or comments in there before we move on to the uh, FY20U2 budget discussion? Yes. All right, Greg, did you uh, want to tee up anything there? So as, as mentioned to you, um, the school committee setting up a meeting for your counterparts in Essex, as long, along with both boards of, of both committees, both finance committees in the two, town, two towns aiming to meet uh, next week, March 11th, um, to take a deeper dive on sort of the long range uh, projections for, for school budgets and how those get funded. Um, as, as I think we talked a little bit about at your last meeting. Um, the school committee has uh, approved recommending a, a, an appropriations or total budget, I should say, that increases three and a half percent. Essex is is struggling to balance their budget, and they have asked for a two and a half percent overall increase um, to the to the district's budget, um, suggesting that they dip into their reserves more heavily than they currently are planning. Um, though they are planning to dip into it um, a, a fair amount under their proposal at three and a half percent. So this is uh, teed up for, for next week to have a more in-depth discussion about how best to proceed 
um, whether or not the, the two and a half budget approach is something that should be planned for year year after year, um, or if in, indeed we do a, a temporary heavy dip into um, the school's reserves. And it would certainly tee up then if we don't make significant changes to the operating budget for the school, it would certainly tee up having um, an override sooner rather than later for the, uh, for the school to continue uh, to have the funding that they, they currently, uh, currently need for the programming that they offer. Um, so that's next week. Um, the Finance Committee is, is working through all the departmental requests. Um, those are going fairly smoothly. Um, this uh, coming Wednesday, they will be taking up the, the discussion on, on dispatch. You're certainly invited to attend um, and, and listen in on that discussion and participate. Um, so I'd say from a town operating budget, I think the, the two outstanding issues, the larger two outstanding issues that we have left are the question of dispatch and staffing at the fire department. There's still some work to do on capital um, and we'll continue with that as well. Um, but probably dispatch and fire staffing are the two biggest issues remaining. Questions, comments from the board? I'm sorry, I, I was not paying it sufficient attention. When is the finance committee taking up dispatch? It'll be this, this Wednesday at uh, seven o'clock. And that's a joint meeting? And we, can, we can post it as a joint meeting. I would assume it's already been posted. Uh, the finance committee has posted it. We, we still can post for you um, tomorrow morning and, and be on time. Yeah, I thought that that was going to be a joint meeting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought so too. <laughs> They're posting the, uh, so we can, we can put up a, a posting tomorrow so that it's, it's official meeting for you as well. That would be a good idea because that's why um, I originally we originally had dispatch planned on discussion here and um, we moved it over to or we just uh, decided to, to join the FinCon meeting. And I thought that uh, uh, Sarah Mellish was expecting us to be joint there as well. Yeah, I think she, she is expecting that. I think she just, again, using the template that she had. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, if there's no other conversations on, but uh, questions on budget, I think we can um, move off the annual town meeting topic. Eli, Eli, thank you for taking this out of order. I appreciate it. I, I am going to sign off tonight, but I will be on for your workshop on Thursday on the 40B. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. I'll see you then. Yep. All right. Move on to item number three, which is the 40B project update. Um, okay. So um, um, Thursday, we will be having our third uh, round of negotiations or discussions with the developer. Um, and he has sent us, well, he sent us a few things over the past uh, couple of weeks. One was um, some detailed information, more detailed information that we had asked for about the, um, uh, oh, Sarah Mellis, you have your hand raised. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. So when we scheduled the March 3rd meeting, we decided it would not be joined, but Jeffrey was going to attend it. Um, we can it, so it was not posted as a joint meeting. Ah. But anyone who wants to join is welcome. 
Okay. Um, I think we may want to um, go ahead and try and uh, adjust to a joint posting um, because there's some information that Jeff and I were trying to acquire um, that which might be useful to um, uh, that discussion if we can get it before Wednesday. I so, think we're challenged with the timeline. It had to be posted to today. Yeah. But you're welcome to join us. All right. Um, oh, wait, I have an idea on how to deal with this. Um, Love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me, Greg, let me talk to you um, tomorrow um, and uh, uh, I'll make a recommendation. Uh, <clears throat> We can uh, roll up some of our information and um, give it to Greg to present um, and be in listen mode at that particular meeting. Sounds good. All right. Um, back to the 40B discussion. Um, Okay, so we got information from the developer on um, uh, the uh, wetlands bylaw provisions that he had been asking or wanting to ask for waivers for, thought he was going to need waivers for. That information was given to the Conservation Commission and they in turn gave us back a report um, on uh, uh, what, what the different aspects of the... Um, uh, We've done that. Hey, Sarah, I'm going to meet you. Thanks. Um, so uh, we have the report from the Conservation Commission on which, uh, which parts of those, uh, the wetlands bylaws uh, are, are different between the town's uh, wetland bylaws and the state's laws and which ones the Conservation Commission viewed as particularly important and, and how it relates to the 40B project. Um, we also got from the developer a list of um, uh, their current set of um, conditions that they would agree to and under which conditions they would agree to those conditions. Um, it doesn't include a couple of the conditions that we had originally talked about under environmental because we haven't actually had that discussion with the developer yet. And it didn't include sidewalks, but that was kind of an omission because, um, uh, well, the developer's still working on it. So um, uh, the developer is uh, pushing fairly hard at this point for uh, us to come to a conclusion one way or another to uh, indicate to him whether or not the board feels like it um, can come up with a set of conditions under which we would endorse the project. And uh, I think on uh, Thursday, we're gonna be under um, uh, increasing pressure to uh, make it a, a decision uh, or to, to indicate fairly strongly which way we're leaning on this. Um, so uh, what I wanna talk about tonight uh, in this part of the meeting is um, the terms and conditions the developer gave us and uh, where we want to um, uh, communicate uh, uh, other terms and conditions ahead of the, the um, Thursday meeting. And um, you know, so let's start with that. So uh, board members have had an opportunity to look at the developers um, list of terms and conditions. And by the way, I think what we'll probably end up doing is we'll take that uh, letter and we'll put it on the, the uh, 40B website. Um, so the members of the public can um, have some visibility into it. It's about, uh, 20 conditions, and they're all basically the same as the ones we've been discussing over the past um, several weeks, with some differences in the um, uh, 
dollar amounts, for example, that they, the developer would be willing to give um, to, uh, towards uh, certain capital requests, for example. So um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read through all 20 of them tonight, but we will uh, go ahead and make that available for people ahead of the meeting on Thursday. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, board members, do you uh, have comments on the individual conditions and things that you want uh, clarification on or uh, things that we wanna to communicate to the developer ahead of the Thursday meeting? Eli. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Um, I, I had a question about whether we had a written agreement with the developer regarding our um, bringing in peer review consultants into the board's process um, where he had agreed to pay for that. That was my understanding before we started to bring in the peer review consultants. Uh, and that's not the understanding of item number nine in this agreement, in this uh, proposal. So the caveat has always been there from his perspective that he would pay if he got an approved loan. And so that's what he said. That's in writing? Uh, yes, I mean, that's his, his communications have always been there. That was not my understanding, so that's, that's on me. Other board members? I, I have a couple of just points of wanting clarification. On item three, Eli, it states that the, the developer will maintain the same proportions of three, two, one, one plus bedroom units. Um, and I, we've, I've brought this up before, but then in his um, visual that he provides, it's three, two plus, two, one plus, and one. Um, anyway, it, it just, they don't say the same thing. Well, um, uh, you mean because it doesn't mention two plus in the- Correct, yep. Okay. I just think it needs to be, they need to say the same thing. And um, the other was, um, uh, in 20, where he talks about um, compliance of wastewater system and stormwater management system, um, and I easily may have missed this, but um, we still haven't had um, proper information regarding how the handling of snow will be done. And, you know, the, the plowing it off to the sides and building up high banks of snow is not handling it. So if I recall at a previous meeting, there was a request to the developer regarding um, yes. about the snow. All right. I'm also curious as to um, the, the, the final comment by the developer, um, again, to tie into municipal sewer. Well, so he, he would love to tie into municipal sewer. He said it over right. and over again. He used to say it, and he told him over and over again. We want you to stick with your original plan, which was to uh, have on-site septic. Right. Um, I don't think we've changed our position on that. 
Saying that, I mean, yep. that's what he wants. Uh, it continues to be a negotiation, so people can ask for whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And our position still remains that we want to go with the on site septic for his original. Is that Kitty? Yeah. Mm. So, in the, in the body of this proposal, um, I mean, I've been over it several times, and I'm I'm not seeing it as I go over it again now. Um, is there a condition in this proposal from his point of view that he obtains all those waivers that he's asking from the BOS? All the waivers of, uh, of uh, CONCOM? No, it's put differently, right? I mean, where's the word encourage? Um, number 15. Thank you. So number 15. Says the Board of Selectmen will encourage through its support of the LIP application the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant all necessary waivers from local zoning and conservation bylaws that are necessary to build the project as represented in design. So that's, I mean, that word encourage, um, frankly, it seems to me like item 15 could just be removed from here because it's not really an effective clause. Um, and mm -hmm. Uh, do that and leave it up to the Zoning Board of Appeals to um, uh, uh, go through the normal process of, um, you know, uh, if they, if, if the developer needs a waiver, they apply for the waiver from the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Board of Appeals either grants it or not. And then they appeal it if they need to. Right. So I don't know why we, we really need at this point to have it in, um, in there. It's not, not in our best interests. Uh, and I don't think it really helps the developer all that much. Okay, just wanted to make sure I understood that for what it was, that it was. Yeah, I believe that's the one. <clears throat> so I'll make a couple of observations in here. Um, at our last meeting, we had said that we would trade out the um, turf field um, mm -hmm. for, for an additional contribution to the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, the developers' numbers that came back said that he's agreeing putting $500,000 um, to the fire department to be used at their discretion. So that's more broad than we had asked for. We just said fire equipment. Um, $350,000. Eli, may I interrupt a minute? Yeah. I'm sorry, the, he, he said those numbers apply only if we successfully get that, that $1 million grant. Uh, right. Right, from MassWorks. I just yeah. want to make sure that, that you know, these, he's only willing to do that if we get that grant, that MassWorks grant. Yeah, so. that's a million. Um. <clears throat> So the numbers were 500,000 fire department, 350,000 the affordable housing trust and 100,000 in the town, uh, town's turf field project. But above that, he also said that he would unconditionally um, as a condition of receiving an occupancy permit find uh, 250,000 of the uh, affordable housing trust. So the sum total uh, that would go into the affordable housing trust uh, if he got the MassWorks grant would be um, $600,000. But there's also $100,000 that goes into the turf field project. In our last meeting, we said well, we would trade off the um, uh, turf field project uh, for um, uh, some total of a million going into the um, affordable housing trust. And I want to get boards, the board's feelings on uh, what their opinions are about the, the, uh, this set of proposed conditions and whether or not we want to um, ask him to move the turf field. Uh, money into the affordable housing trust on Thursday. Eli, if I may. Go ahead, Becky. That would be my preference. I mean, that's what we stated last time. And that, not that, you know, I don't, I definitely think our turf field projects are very important. Um, but that would be 
my inclination is to have it go towards affordable housing trust. I, and uh, Eli, I agree with Becky. I think it's a more relevant um, donation. Other board members? I, I would just assume, I would rather see it in the uh, Affordable Housing Trust. I would as well. All right. Uh, the other, um, one of the other main differences from uh, our discussions before, uh, we had asked uh, for money to go into a shuttle system to um, support, um, well, to hopefully reduce uh, the impact of, of parking to parking in the downtown area and traffic overall. And in his current proposal, he, he says the applicant will make a one-time capital contribution of 25,000 of the shuttle system. Um, well, it says, quote, on after that shuttle system has been established. But um, I think there's just some typos in there. The relevant part is a one-time capital number of $25,000. Um, uh, where's the board stand on that? Before, we'd been looking for an annual contribution to support that system. I think an annual contribution is appropriate. This is not a one-time thing. Um, that building is going to be there for a long time. I tend to agree. And I wonder about what, uh, what we could um, uh, do to um, I don't know if there are additional conditions that could be attached to it to make it um, uh, more acceptable. So for example, um, uh, make a $25,000 annual contribution um, provided that the occupancy is above some percentage or do we just want to simply say um, $25,000 uh, annual contribution? I think originally we'd said 50. I think there should be, um, if, if the shuttle isn't being used, then I don't think it's reasonable to assess the same amount of money. Plus, um, I would think that the value of that donation, um, depending on what the value of the dollar is, is going to change. So to just put in a, a, a dollar amount um, for forever. That's true. It's not as logical as a as a percentage use, perhaps. Well, not that I know the answer. How we figure it out? That what we really want is we want an annual contribution, and um, we need to hash out the amount. And conditions of the amount, um, and and uh, leave it at that, as opposed to trying to beat out a number right now, and just have that conversation with them on Thursday. Mm -hmm. My thought about this is that there's there's no plan to have a shuttle in Manchester without this development, and. Um, if he's unwilling to, if he and his partners are unwilling to support that shuttle system to some extent um, in a formula to be determined, um, then we scuttle the shuttle. Period. Um, it makes the place much less attractive. I'm 
sort of guessing, and I think I know what he would say, but. Um, <clears throat> yeah, he would say scuttle it. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the reason we put the shuttle up there in the first place is because we want to try and mitigate. Uh, we thought it was the best way for us to potentially mitigate um, you know, traffic and parking impact. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we would suffer. We, the collective town, would suffer more without the shuttle. I'm personally inclined to push. Do we know how much it would cost to put the shuttle in? So a few years ago, we had worked with CADA um, on a, uh, a loop basically for the AM and PM commuter time and then some lesser frequency during non-commuter time. Um, and the, the cost for that service was just just north of a hundred thousand a year to to run that service, but some of that was going to be um, supported through the MBTAs. Correct. Uh, there's a certain percentage of, of um, uh, local taxes or user fees that go from the uh, go into the MBTA to provide. Um, or for the uh, provision of shuttle services, but it just basically gets soaked up by the MBTA right now. However, municipalities have the right to um, uh, um, apply for uh, some other entity to provide those shuttle services like CADA. And then the MBTA has to give up that uh, um, sum of money. And I don't remember what it was. Do you remember, Greg? Yeah, it was. Um... It's around 115,000 a year. Yeah. So would so, it pay for the whole shuttle system? That version of it, yes. That version, yeah. So this this would ex obviously expand it a bit. Um, and and we're talking, you know, prices four or five years ago. So. Because the question in my mind is, is who else benefits from having a shuttle system? We don't have, like Rockport has, parking systems outside of the downtown village. And so people park there and then they can take a shuttle into, into the village and take a shuttle back out to their car. We don't have that kind of a system. And who, other than this development, who would be benefiting from this? I mean- Yeah, so, so longer term, you know- if, if, Longer term, yeah. if there's some, housing development on the other side of the, of the road. Um, or, or, or commercial, yes. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't think this, you know, this project doesn't get built tomorrow, <laughs> even if he gets a, a permit. So I think, you know, if we're looking five years down the road, I think we have potentially a different environment up there. Okay. Eli, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Becky. Um, to Jeff's comment, does it does it make sense for our town to look into something along the lines of the Rockport trolley as opposed to CADA and and thinking about um, other areas of parking, um, especially if coming into this spring, um, I'm guessing we're going to lose the parking that's back, uh, the church parking that was allowed for us to use behind the bank. So is this something we should explore anyway and possibly tie in to a development at some point? In what way as a condition? or something that we would discuss on Thursday. Well, as opposed to um, having a, um, a specific shuttle named, I think we've been talking about Cape Ann Transit at this point, but well, if we, I'm sorry. 
Well, we've been discussing that internally. We haven't been telling the developer Cape Ann Transit. We use this as an exemplary. Um, okay. A generic shuttle. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so again, my inclination is to communicate to the developer that we do want, um, we, we still are interested in the annual contribution to a shuttle in the form of that. Uh, something that we want to hash out um, and would like to discuss on Thursday. Is that a fair communication for us to make? I see nodding heads. Yes. It's a yes. Um, Other comments uh, on any of these conditions that uh, we want to uh, uh, discuss tonight. Yeah, Eli, I have a question about the follow-up uh, email that um, mm -hmm. Mr. Engler had sent with regard to the sidewalks. Yeah, go ahead. And by the way, Mike, I see your hand raised. Um, I'll get to you in a little bit. And uh, I mean, he has acceded to the fact that yes, he needs some sort of a, a waiver from the um, uh, from the ADA, and he's willing to uh, to apply for that. His indication is that those waivers are quote customarily granted. I don't know. Uh, and he also indicated that he'd be willing to. Um, also include the sidewalk from 128 to the entry of the development. Um, I'm just trying to think, he, he indicated that, yeah, it costs money. He thought that the request was something that wasn't necessarily, uh, he didn't necessarily see a value in it, but that's his perspective. But I guess my question is, so what's his incentive? <laughs> to put that in there. He doesn't care if the waiver goes through or not. Actually, he cares if it does go through because it costs him money. And so I'm thinking how this might be dealt with in some way. I don't know. One thing that I would say is waiver or no waiver, I'm certainly interested in the sidewalk going to the de de development the entry of the development that what two or three hundred feet down uh, School Street. Yep. <clears throat> I, I think we could ask um, our think, attorney to, to craft some yeah. language that would um, require a, you know a full faith effort to obtain right. That's... obtain the waiver. We can participate in that process. Yeah. Um, those are public hearings that, that these waiver requests take place at. Um, so I think I think you could do a little more than just yeah keep your keep your fingers crossed that he's yeah I didn't know <laughs> that's not a that, that's not a strategy <laughs> right right uh, on that sidewalk um, I'd like to see some sort of drawing of what his experts say his experts say he could he could put in All right. Um, uh, Mike, I'm going to get to you in a minute, but I have a couple of other things to kind of, uh, finish off here before I, I uh, consider opening it up right now. Um, so, uh, John, did you have anything else on sidewalks? Um, no, I'm interested in what Mr. Witten would have to say. I, I agree, but that's that was really the crux of my my concern. Okay. All right. 
Um, well, another thing that was missing, uh, although he did include a uh, discussion about irrigation, um, which I don't think mm -hmm. was for him, uh, he did not include any of the uh, discussion that we had about uh, uh, no net um, uh, increase in uh, nutrient loading uh, beyond the borders of the um, uh, beyond the border border of the development, and uh, this is something that we will want to discuss with him on Thursday. Uh, board members have any comments on that before we move on? His question about that, Eli, had been, how would you measure it? Greg. So there are, there are uh, first of all, there are standards um, and, and it's, it's the, um, the applicant developer's burden to, to demonstrate that they're meeting positively, um, that they aren't showing, having an, an increase. I think, again, um, I think Attorney Witten could give us some guidance on, on that. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Greg, I'd be happy to respond if, if you'd like me to. Yes, please. So the the ability to monitor down gradient property boundary um, effluent is, is pretty straightforward. It's done through monitoring wells and pre and post conditions. So the pre-construction nitrogen levels are monitored and then the post nitrogen levels are monitored. So it, it's a routine practice and it's a requirement of the issuance of a groundwater discharge permit anyway. So the issuance of the groundwater discharge permit will include a condition of generally uh, could be quarterly monitoring, sometimes it's twice a year, and it's to measure down gradient flow. Um, so in a case like this, if that were a condition that the, the board wished to impose and the ZBA wished to impose as well, um, it's, it's consistent with the issuance of a groundwater discharge permit and the town could have greater standards than the Commonwealth. So instead of five milligrams per liter of nitrogen, it, the, the board could request a more restrictive standard. Um, phosphorus is another parameter that can be monitored. The, the, the issue sometimes is what do you do if the numbers exceed the, the required amount? Um, and there are treatment methodologies that can be employed, but uh, it's perfectly permissible uh, as a condition uh, for the issuance of a groundwater discharge permit to include that kind of down gradient uh, trigger, whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen uh, or both. So again, it's my um, expectation that we're going to have that discussion on Thursday. All right, do board members have any other comments before I uh, 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 let Mr. Mike here uh, speak? All right, Mike. Uh, Go ahead and uh, uh, unmute yourself, identify yourself fully. And uh, Hi, Eli. It's, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Uh, Mike Ross Marin. Uh, just a quick question going back to the CADA bus. If I recall from the recent BOS FinCom meeting, that when some of the numbers were gone over with everything, we're already about a million dollars in the hole on this as far as tax base goes. The CADA bus is going to cost another hundred thousand, and if we're just talking about twenty-five thousand dollar contribution, we're just adding to what we're a net negative already. So I don't see that this project should go forward without them funding a CADA bus, because as Mr. Bodner Turner said, it's not going to benefit anyone else but this particular development. 
is not going to benefit the downtown. It's not going to benefit anything because the amount of parking or whatever, but it's going to be a shuttle that's going to have to be run. That's my entire comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, board members, any um, comments or thoughts before we move on? Jeff, I'm not sure if you're getting ready to talk or not. I am. Uh, th thank you for noticing the scrunched up eyebrows. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Did I just hear um, the last question or comment uh, put forth that this project is already a million dollars in the hole for the town? I, I'm so, uncomfortable with that comment sitting because that's not the case, at least in terms of all the financial impacts that we've looked at and the reports of the uh, that we've reviewed that this is a net positive in tax revenue. So the, the finance committee has had some discussions. Um, they are working on a, on a report that they'll get to you. Um, they have taken a bit of a contrarian view about um, how you assess the impact of the, the student costs in particular. Um, and, and that would drive up the, the cost of the project in terms of its burden to the town significantly. And when will we see this since we are going into another negotiation session, uh, which from the developer's point of view is gonna be his cards on the table final on Thursday. Right. Um, it's probably a week or so away. And I feel like the BOS is in a vice. And it's in a vice between the town, certain citizens of the town, now a board, and the developer. And I'm concerned that if they are presenting numbers that indicate that this is not, this, this project is going to have a fiscal impact that goes well beyond what the original fiscal impact report and the peer review said, why that is not in our hands today. How can we possibly be making decisions if we're going to be headed up with a finance committee report after Thursday? And I realize the finance committee's got a lot on their plate that we have to run the town, that we have to create a budget for the annual town meeting. But I'm I'm really surprised to hear what you just said, Greg. And that we as at least for me as a board member, I don't know whether other board members were aware of this. Um, I just finding out about this tonight. So not to under um underestimate the concerns about fiscal impact, but the reality is state law doesn't allow us to approve or deny a project based on its fiscal impact. It's not a criterion that we are allowed to uh, weigh in on. Um, so, <laughs> um, it, it may influence you how you might want to negotiate, but at the end of the day, the state doesn't care. 
State does not care if this project costs us money or not. As a board, as a member of the Board of Selectmen who's been involved in the negotiations of a so-called friendly 40B, I care. No, I, I, I get that. If we, get that. Didn't, if we had this information up front, if we had these finance committee deliberations up front, we would have been asking for a, a lot of other mitigation in the, in the friendly 40B format. Yeah, I think you, well, it would be difficult to um, win that argument when you've got two um, well-respected uh, fiscal experts using a methodology that is sort of tried and true. It would be difficult for who to win what argument? It would be too difficult for our, us in our finance committee to win the argument that they're trying to put forward. Well, obviously they're spending time on this. I mean, I don't want to waste the board's time tonight with this. I'm just I'm real uncomfortable with what I just heard. Sarah Mellis, did you have a comment? Yes, I think in the finance committee and as do their due diligence and we have concerns regarding the ultimate finance considerations of the town. But we have a report ready to come out later this week. Sarah, with all due respect, why haven't we seen this earlier? We're working on it. I hear that, but I'm still asking the question. I, I think it's been a challenge with respect to the 40B development and how the finance committee would, would weigh in. And our position is that we want to alert the town people regarding the potential implications. So maybe uh, the finance committee can discuss this again uh, this Wednesday and perhaps provide a summary of the information that they have. Thank you. Uh, so far. It's our agenda for 3-3. Three, three. Thank yeah. you, sir. So uh, we can uh, uh, go and listen to what they have to say uh, at that meeting. Other board members, other questions before we move on from this topic for now? Sandy, I see your hand raised, but I'm not going to be taking any additional public comment tonight. All right, so. Um, let's move on to the town administrator's report. I'll be brief. Um, uh, had some good news last week in terms of um, some resources for the community. The, uh, the grant application before the Seaport Economic Development Council um, was successful in terms of seeking um, the bulk of the dollars for the construction of the uh, construction of the floats, the ramp out at Tux Point. Um, so an eight hundred eleven thousand dollar grant was received uh, for that work. We hope to um, get that project out to bid just as soon as we can, and hope to have construction uh, with any luck take place this this May and into June, and have it ready for the bulk of the season this this summer. Um, there was a second smaller grant that was awarded again from the from the council, and this is a study um, to take a look at expanding um, 
the ability for uh, commercial fishermen to have slips um, near uh, the commercial uh, pier, Morse Pier at Moscow. And instead of having all of the fishermen um, have to be on moorings, um, it would be uh, the possibility of providing slips um, right, off the, right off the pier, um, avoid having them to um, go in and out uh, in either a dinghy or bringing their boat into the, to the pier. Um, so that'll be a study that'll be reviewed and, and subject for future discussion as to whether or not that's something we wanna um, proceed, proceed with. Um, but um, kudos to, to Brian for writing those grants and obtaining those funds um, to help us move forward with those projects. Um, the, uh, we continue to pursue um, uh, various permitting and licensing questions concerning activity at the uh, Colonel Bunham Way. Um, and we'll give you more of an update when we hear back, um, both from uh, our building inspector and from, from others on that. Um, uh, the um, discussions have um, on the LCD and the, what approach is best to take continues. Um, a good discussion and forum this past Tuesday, last week. And uh, there was a presentation by a couple of the landowners. Um, Mr. Simboli, um, the owner of the MAC in particular, um, presented some potential build out scenarios. Um, that uh, was the subject of a lot of discussion, um, a lot of good questions. And uh, the planning board will continue to, to work through the different um, options that are, are presented in terms of possibility of changing some of our zoning for those areas. And um, as you know, we're not gonna be taking those up at the Springtown meeting, but they will continue to work and have things um, teed up for some fall votes. Um, again, there are various options and the efforts will continue. Um, we will be trying to schedule um, a meeting of, of the various land use boards. Um, in the near future, just to give a, everyone a chance to get a sense of where things are and, and to better hear from the various board members on what you think might be the best approach uh, for the different um, opportunities that might present itself in the, in the LCD. Um, and then finally, just some, some staffing changes. Um, uh, Adele uh, has retired uh, from her position as an assistant to the town clerk and also her role to the ZBA. So we'll be looking to fill those slots. Um, Pauline is also gonna be stepping down from the planning board. So we may try to fill both slots with one part-time person um, to provide support and, and clerical support and um, just technical support to both the ZBA and the planning board uh, in their work. Um, and our new town clerk, Diane Buco, she'll be looking to hire probably a part-time person then in, in the clerk's office. And we'll be giving you updates as uh, we work on those replacements. So that's enough for me for now. And uh, you can keep going with the rest of the meeting. Okay, any questions on town administrator's report? There's one item I forgot to mention uh, back when we were talking about the annual town meeting. Um, uh, something occurred to me over the weekend and as we moved the uh, meeting date out to Jan uh, June 21st. Last year, the um, uh, municipal elections also moved. Um, but um, this year they're not. And we typically, what we do is we have the municipal elections and then uh, the first board meeting after the municipal elections, which is usually essentially first meeting in June, we have our reorganizational meeting, um, elect a new chair, et cetera. And uh, as I said uh, at the beginning of uh, this year, uh, it is not my intention to be the chair next year. So um, now the thing there is annual town meeting uh, is going to fall um, after what would ordinarily be our uh, or reorganizational meeting. It's typically uh, the chair 
that does uh, the opening of the marks, does the rest of the annual town report, etc. So, um, question is, what do board members think about postponing the reorganizational meeting until uh, after the annual town meeting? And I remain in the chair position until uh, that time. So we'd have the annual town meeting and then the very first meeting after that we do the reorganizational meeting. So uh, how do board members feel about that um, concept? Would you prefer to go ahead and do the reorganizational meeting before? Um, what's your preference? I think we should move the reorganizational meeting to um, the last week in May of 2022. <laughs> 2023. <laughs> All right, you, uh, you knew that was coming. Yeah. All right, so board members are all right with that? <laughs> that a rhetorical question? Honest question. I, thank you, Eli. I think that that makes sense. And, and yeah. we, we thank you for your service as our chair. Or I do. Absolutely. I do. All of us do. Okay. All right. Um, so I don't have any other members as may have not have been reasonably anticipated by the day. We got to change that sentence. Um, but we will be moving into um, executive session, not to move, uh, re well, uh, return to open session. So I'll take a motion to move into executive session, not to return to open session under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, uh, Reason 3. Hang on. This is never precise enough. To discuss strategy with respect of collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting, meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. And under Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Section Reason 6, to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real estate if the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiation position Negotiate, negotiating position of the public body and the chair does so declare. So moved. Yes, second. Sir. Any discussion? All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Round. Yes. Ms. Jakes. Yes. Mr. Bob Turner. Yes. Mr. Bowling vote. Yes. I'm going to uh, request a um, uh, a two minute bio break while the rest of the people clear out of the meeting and, uh, and we'll uh, switch into executive. All right. Sounds excellent.